So that's the basic overview on these three big epidemics that hit Westeros in the 300 years since the Targaryen unification. Moving on from that, in terms of analysis, can we say how they compared to each other in terms of severity? You know, which one was the worst one? Well, it's a little difficult because we don't have both death counts and survivability ratios for all three of them. For some, but not the other one. I'll go through that. And another complication is, you know, it does say the death rate wasn't uniform across all of Westeros for these things. It consistently says death rate was always worse in the cities, which are crowded, and worst of all in the biggest and most crowded city, King's Landing. So when we get like a death rate for Old Town, it does say, well, King's Landing was worse than that. And can we extrapolate from that? I'm not sure. But when you get this high death rate in King's Landing, that doesn't mean it was the same at the Inn at the Crossroads in the Riverlands. And even then, there's exceptions. Going through all three of them, just what if you want to play around with this, what numbers do we have from the books? I'll just present it here. What do we know? It said that the Shivers killed a quarter of the population in Old Town, which is slightly smaller than King's Landing. And it just generally says that it killed a quarter of Old Town, and it was worse in King's Landing. We don't know how worse. But let's say at least 25% of King's Landing died. In terms of survivability, pretty low. It said that only one out of five people who caught the shivers survived it. Then for the winter fever, it stated that killed one-fifth of the population in King's Landing, 20%. Conversely, it's also said that fully half of the people in Sisterton died in the Three Sisters Islands. But we can easily reconcile that, that it's also stated the disease was a lot more potent in colder climates, like the Three Sisters, like White Harbor, like all of the North and Winterfell. So that's why this is one of the few cases where the death rate somewhere was actually higher than in King's Landing, because it thrived in cold weather. So even though the death rate was 1 in 5 in King's Landing, when we get stories following Cregan Stark rallying the North during the winter fever... I wouldn't consider it unreasonable for House of the Dragon to say that, oh no, fully half of the people in Winterfell died, if that's how bad it was in colder climates. that They established that by way of, well, this is what it was like in the Three Sisters, and it was lower than that in the South. Uh, the survivability rate, it said that one in four people who caught it survived, so a bit higher than the Shivers. And last, we have the Great Spring Sickness, where it stated 40% of the total population in King's Landing died. But it also says that ratio is the uppermost end of the spectrum. It was worst in the capital. It wasn't quite as bad in Old Town, slightly better in Lannisport. You know, it isn't the same. I don't think 40% of Winterfell died in the Great Spring Sickness the way 40% died in King's Landing. And there's simply been no statement about survivability rates. You know, how many men who caught it survived the Great Spring Sickness? But in terms of we're trying to measure the societal impact of how many able-bodied soldiers were left alive from this that are able to maintain order, survivability rates aren't too important. You just, you're just more focused on who actually died. Because I don't want to turn this into, into some gory spectacle of, oh no, it's one of those tropical diseases that makes your flesh rot away from your bones, which if you go to some isolated tropical island in Sothorios, deep in the jungle, yeah, you can catch some rare disease that kills people like that, but these aren't commonly encountered unless they spread to the free cities or Westeros. We're talking about things people in Westeros or maybe the free cities commonly encounter. I mean, like, even today, if I went to the heart of the rainforest, yeah, I could probably catch some tropical disease I normally wouldn't catch in the United States. But I'd have to try to do that. That's rare. And it, things that have 100% lethality. I mean, um, the island of Nath has the butterfly fever, which you know, makes your flesh uh, just slough off the bone like wet parchment. And that's 100% lethal. But the, uh, it isn't a widespread disease. It's, it's a rarity. It's an oddity. And that type of thing catches headlines. I mean, the shivers was just a really bad influenza-like disease, but it killed tens of thousands of people. 
that doesn't grab headlines the way butterfly fever does. But I'm talking about what are things that have a large scale societal impact. So these aren't 100% lethal things, low transmission rate. You know, the other end of the spectrum, the common cold is very widespread, but very survivable. So let's focus on lethality, long-term societal impact. In terms of that, which we do have the figures for more than survivability, the winter fever was clearly the least of these three epidemics. It was bad because it hit them when they weren't prepared for it. It, it was a long winter. They were just after a civil war, so there was famine. But had this happened in peace, it might not have been so bad. That Winter fever was unusually worse in the north, but it never even reached the cities of Old Town and Lannisport on the west coast. It never even hit all of Westeros. It was localized. It had big effects because it hit the capital where a lot of main characters live. But in terms of direct impact on King's Landing, it killed 20% compared to the 40% of the Great Spring Sickness. So how many people died in King's Landing because of the shivers? That's the remaining question. You just, okay, if the clearly winter fever wasn't the highest, did the shivers kill up to 40% of the population? All we know is it was more than 25%, that Old Town was 25%, and it was higher than that. But how much is more than? That's the question. I think if it was up to 40%, Martin would have mentioned it. Something that drastic, you don't go, oh yeah, it was a bit higher than 25%, by which I mean 40%. It's really burying the lead there. So I, I don't jump to that, that... Ultimately, I think the Great Spring Sickness had the highest death ratio of any of these, narrowly edging out the shivers. The reason I bring this up is just in terms of the worst epidemic to ever hit Westeros from a fandom point of view out of universe. For the past 15 years since Martin published that uh, Duncan Egg novella, we've been treating the Great Spring Sickness as Westeros' equivalent to the Black Death. And in terms of lethality, it assuredly was, you know, killing 40% of the population, that's like how much of Europe died in the Black Death. But suddenly, now in 2018, 15 years later, we're hearing about the shivers was this other super epidemic that hit. So head to head, which one was worse? Ultimately, while the Great Spring Sickness had a higher death rate, because Dorn and the Vale managed to to isolate themselves, it wasn't quite as widespread. Whereas the shivers, given that we have been told about any other quarantines, this affected every single part of the Seven Kingdoms. So it's quality over quantity of, you know, 40% of King's Landing died, but no one in Dorne died. And in terms of the overall death rate, I know there aren't that many people living in Dorne, it's not heavily populated. It, the Great Spring Sickness narrowly edges it out in terms of total deaths, by disease, but then you're talking about it as an event. That as an event, the spring sickness happened in the spring. That travel was okay versus the shivers happened in the middle of a long winter that buried everyone under snow. That if you're talking about the shivers not as the disease, but the winter of the shivers was probably you, know, you see how that that makes up for the slightly lower death rate. That having like 30% death rate in King's Landing to 40%, but there was also this famine winter where a lot of people just died from cold, I think that evens it out. Maybe. <laughs> just for the point of discussion here, was the winter of the shivers, the disease plus the heavy winter, as bad as the Great Spring Sickness, which had a higher death rate, but there wasn't snow? Depends on your POV. <laughs> I mean, seriously, uh, if you were lucky enough to be trapped in Dorne during the Great Spring Sickness, like Duncan Egg were, the whole event probably wasn't that bad to live through. There wasn't any plague, nor was there winter snow in the Vale, even. If you were trapped in the Erie, there wasn't snow you had to deal with. You wouldn't have known there was a plague going on in the rest of Westeros. I mean, trade and travel would have been down to nothing because you were quarantined, but... Wherever you happened to be holed up would have been pleasant. I don't think things were that bad in the Erie at the time, in the Vale. So Great Spring Sickness was worse, but more localized. I think the shivers sounds worse, but and also uh, 
that was an era of peace. The Great Spring Sickness, on top of that, it weakened the realm so much it encouraged more Blackfire rebellions, which is politically, you know, the Shivers by 20 years later didn't have long lasting effects. The Great Spring Sickness, it killed a king, it killed his heirs, had a lot more long term consequences. But I'm not sure if we're comparing one or the other, the, which one was the worst epidemic they ever had. But please discuss this in the comments. That's why I'm making this to he hear your view on it. And leaving these three epidemics completely behind, uh, a brief mention at the end here of other major diseases and quarantines in the history of Westeros. That you've heard a lot about, I was talking about butterfly fever, that's not a Westeros thing. That You've heard a lot about grayscale. It, grayscale captures headlines and it's infamous because it's considered a death sentence, this slow death sentence over many years and horrifically your skin turning hard like it's stone. But grayscale really isn't a very widespread disease in Westeros. They say that. I mean, it happens. It happens in King's Landing. It's even been known to happen north of the Wall. The wildlings know what grayscale is. It happens to them every now and again. But even there, it's just not that common. They say it's a bit more common in the free cities, but not at epidemic levels. It's about as common as, uh, for some reason... Leprosy has always was always relatively common in the in the Near East. Uh, in uh, I'm I'm thinking of Crusaders going to Jerusalem and getting the and getting leprosy or something. Uh, that for some reason the climate or the moisture is just conducive to leprosy in the Levant of the Near East in a way it isn't in Western Europe. There's medical reasons why. I, other people in my classes actually had explanations for this. I, I'm not really sure on it. So, like, the, the point is, in the free cities, for climate reasons, or because of a magical curse or whatever from the Roinar, grayscale is a bit more common, but it isn't like an epidemic. It's in the background of every now and again, we have to get people who contracted grayscale and send them to quarantine at the Roinar ruins uh, the ruined city of Croyane. The TV show condensed that to be Valyria, but it, it's Croyane, this Roynar city on the lake, where it's this giant leper colony for people with grayscale. But grayscale isn't an epidemic. It's not spread through contact with other people just breathing their air. It's only spread explicitly through touch contact. So it doesn't spread that much. I, I bring this up because mostly because there is an even more deadly variant or cousin of grayscale called the gray plague but it's so lethal that it tends to burn itself out in an infected population before it has time to spread to another region I mean, you see this in epidemiology that something that kills a hundred percent of the people who catch it in a single day tends not to spread very far it's when you have a long incubation period like Grayscale takes years to die from. You can potentially spread it to a lot of people in the meantime through touch. The, uh, the Gray Plague, you can just catch it from anything, and it it's a lot more lethal and it kills a lot more quickly. Well, then it, it burns itself out. Well, in the fourth novel, there's this whole page-long thing where Grand Maester Pycelle recalls how there was an outbreak of Gray Plague in Old Town, back when he was a boy, and he's an old man, so I've checked the numbers on this, and it, if the Grey Plague struck Old Town when he was a boy, it would still have been at least 10 to 15 years after the Great Spring Sickness. So let's say around the year 220 after Conquest, at least a decade, probably more after the Great Spring Sickness, there was another epidemic but it never got outside of Old Town. It was contained because Lord Hightower successfully quarantined the entire city. And Pycelle explains this. Uh, here's the full quote. I was a boy in Old Town when the Grey Plague took half the city and three quarters of the citadel of the Maesters. Lord Hightower burned every ship in port, closed the gates, and commanded his guards to slay all those who tried to flee, be they men, women, or babes in arms. They killed him when the plague had run its course. On the very day he reopened the port, they dragged him from his horse and slit his throat, and his young sons as well. To this day the ignorant in Old Town will spit at the sound of his name, 
but Quentin Hightower did what was needed. Consider just how bad this could have been without an effective quarantine. Half of Old Town died in this localized epidemic. 50%? That sure beats the 40% death rate that King's Landing had in the Great Spring Sickness. This was worse than that. And this is Old Town. Diseases are usually worse than that when they hit King's Landing. So this didn't spread beyond Old Town. And it happened 10 to 15 years after the Great Spring Sickness. 10 to 15 years after everyone saw how Dorn and the Vale survived the spring sickness by closing their borders. I mean, I, that wouldn't have been a lesson lost on Lord Hightower. So I think that, once again, fits with the trend that as history progressed, Westeros gradually but increasingly got more wary and better about enacting quarantines, learning through painful experience from past failures. We can't let it spread to the rest of the kingdoms. So that's grayscale, more about the quarantine of the Grey Plague. Moving on from that, other diseases that are common diseases, not tropical diseases or, or something. Beyond that, just the major diseases you might encounter, one of the really common ones is the bloody flux, which gets pretty prominent in later books when there are outbreaks of it. And bloody flux is just the term people in the world of Westeros use for dysentery. It is dysentery. It's the same thing. I realize that to some of you, dysentery sounds like a funny disease that men hiding gold watches get. But it's no laughing matter. Dysentery is not a laughing matter. It can kill three out of four men who get it. Baristan Selmy says three out of four men who get it can die if it gets really bad. And he states that the bloody flux has been the bane of every army since the Dawn Age because it usually spreads through unsanitary conditions like with an army on the march. So that's another one you have to look out for. And that leads me to a different point. I've seen some fans theorizing that maybe the White Walkers sent the Great Spring Sickness to weaken Westeros. This is an old theory. This has been around since the mid-2000s, ever since you know, we read about it in 2003. And this type of thinking also flared up again after Fire and Blood came out, with some claiming maybe the White Walkers sent the Shivers because they felt threatened by the Targaryen dragons. Or even some people saying that all three of these epidemics, even Winter Fever, must have been sent by the White Walkers to soften up Westeros. I reject that completely. That's silly. That has no legs to stand on. I mean, by that logic... Did the White Walkers send dysentery to devastate armies in every major war in history? No. The White Walkers didn't send the bloody flux. And even if they were spreading diseases, why wouldn't they be timed to their attack on the Wall? The Shivers happened almost two and a half centuries before their full return. Enough time past that Westeros fully recovered from the Shivers. It took a couple of decades, but it did. By the Dance of the Dragons, you wouldn't even know the Shivers had happened. It, it fully recovered from the Great Spring Sickness, which happened 90 years ago. It took a generation. So, no, I see no line of causation between White Walkers and these three big epidemics. Any more than Grumpkins and Starks caused it. A witch made us do it. A witch cursed us. No. The most pragmatic answer fitting the low fantasy, realistic world of Westeros that Martin made is, hey, it's unsanitary. Sometimes diseases spread a lot. Just because, not because Sauron sent it or the White Walker sent it. Most pragmatic explanation is the unprecedented growth in population, trade, and travel due to the Targaryen unification probably inadvertently helped spread diseases as with any society going through rapid urban growth, but that over the generations they got increasingly better at adapting to these new issues with quarantine practices. And if anyone's wondering, will we see plagues like this in House of the Dragon? I, some people are saying, oh, they're going to do all of Fire and Blood as an anthology. No, Martin said, it's the basis for two prequel pitches. The book has two halves. The first is on the Targaryen Conquest, the second is on the Dance of the Dragons, broadly, and the aftermath of each. 
And given that they said, oh, House of the Dragon is going to lead to Dance of the Dragons, it's probably doing the Dance of the Dragons half, not covering the Conquest. So it would probably feature the Winter Fever, but in a later season. And even if I'm wrong and they're doing the Targaryen Conquest, the way it's split in the middle like that, well, the plague only happens in the time of Aegon the Conqueror's grandson. So either we get the shivers in season seven of a Conquest show, or we get the winter fever in season five to six of a Dance of the Dragons show. That It wouldn't be something in an early season. But yeah, winter fever will be a thing near the end of House of the Dragon. That Cregan Stark will have to deal with. It kills a couple of people who are major POV characters on both sides of the war. Lannisters, Arryns, a lot of people die from it. But putting that aside, I'll leave this discussion of Westeros by pointing out that if these major epidemics were part of a naturally timed disease cycle, natural cycles of public health and disease spread due to weather patterns, epidemiology, what have you. The winter fever came about 70 years after the shivers, right? And the great spring sickness came about 80 years after the winter fever. And the great spring sickness was 90 years before the War of the Five Kings. So if this is indeed a pattern and not random, because their seasons can be unpredictable in terms of the weather, if this is a pattern, wouldn't you say that it's possible that Westeros, at this point in time, is overdue? That they're overdue, as it were, for another major epidemic. That the longest they've ever gone since unification, the longest they've ever gone without a major epidemic, was 80 years, and it's been 90 years now. A corpse stood at the prow of a ship, eyes bright in his dead face, gray lips smiling sadly. But that's the end of all the Westeros stuff. Um, side note here, I try to keep my videos educational on things from the real-life Middle Ages. So I'll give a quick note here. I, I don't have that much stuff on it. But historically, how did quarantines develop in the real Middle Ages? Well, the concept of avoiding travel to a city where a plague is occurring goes back to antiquity in, in, in cultures all over the globe. But specific quarantine measures as we define them... Well, a great example is when the Black Death was hitting Europe starting in 1347 and ultimately killed a third to a half of the people. When the plague came to Italy in 1347, ports would try to turn away ships for fear they carried the disease, but this wasn't done thoroughly enough everywhere. Then, in May of 1348, the next year, Venice in the north, Venice was the first city to close its ports to incoming vessels and put them in a 40-day waiting period, a 40-day quarantine on their ships before they could disembark into the city, because there was a plague going around in the rest of Italy. And this is where we get the term quarantine. Quarantine actually comes from the Italian quaranta giorni, which means 40 days. So it's, they established in Venice, you have to wait the quarantine, you have to wait the 40 days to see if they're sick. And it was during a later outbreak, even beyond this, because uh, it had flare-ups every couple of decades, the plague, it was during a later outbreak in 1423, it's about 75 years later, that Venice went so far as to establish a quarantine island on one of the little islets in the Venice Lagoon which was called a lazaretto, copying the name from Lazar houses, um, safe havens for lepers named after the biblical leper Lazarus. So they said, we, we've built a lazaretto on this isolated island in the lagoon as a quarantine island. And eventually this practice of keeping quarantine islands, small quarantine islands, like in the middle of a river, it could be anywhere. This practice spread across Europe. So they still keep the name Lazaretto. They reused it. So you can find something called a Lazaretto as far afield as in Ireland. And even beyond that, not in the Middle Ages, but in, starting in the 1700s and 1800s, in America, there are place names in Pennsylvania, in Georgia, I've looked this up, where outside of like Philadelphia or something, there's a little islet in a river, which it's called the Lazaretto, because it's where they 
kept people who had yellow fever or malaria or other infectious diseases. But the name comes from the Lazar House islet in Venice when they were establishing quarantines during the Black Death. So there's a lot of these lazarettos, and one of particular note is the lazaretto in Dubrovnik, Croatia, where they filmed a lot of the exterior scenes for King's Landing in Game of Thrones. It's about 300 meters outside the old city walls, but you, you can see it from there. And it's not an island anymore. They had landfills reclaiming land, so it's not an island anymore. But on the coast, I, I looked on Google Maps for this, and, there, and it's actually a famous landmark that they have this big historical complex as a landmark that come and look at the Lazarettos of Dubrovnik. And if you visit there, they'll explain, oh, this used to be an old plague quarantine island, this complex we have. That if you, uh, Tell me in the comments, has anyone here gone on one of the tourism trips, Game of Thrones official tourism trips to Dubrovnik? You might have seen the Lazaretto there, which is an old quarantine station. So stay safe, everyone, and please keep checking back for more updates and subscribe to my channel.